Hello everyone, my name is Meredith Ebbs and I am coming to you from Australia and I live in New South Wales which is on the east coast of Australia. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing today is talking to you about how you can teach outside with STEM to achieve the sustainability development goals and I'm representing the University of Adelaide today but I also have another job as a teacher at a school called The Nature School. And at The Nature School, we work outside a lot. So I'm hopefully going to share some of my experience with you about that role. With the University of Adelaide role, which is the one I'm representing today, I teach teachers how to use technology. And I've been doing that position for four years. So let's get started. As a part of the reconciliation process in Australia with our First Nations people, we actually acknowledge the traditional people at the beginning of a meeting or of our school day. So I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on where, where we work, live, learn and play. And I'd like to recognise their continuing connection to the land, the water and the community. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd like to welcome any First Nations people from anywhere in the world to this presentation today. I'm coming to you from Biripai country where they speak the language of Katang. Today I'm going to be looking uh, through quite a few different concepts. We're going to talk about what is STEM or STEAM, what is the Sustainable Development Goals, just very briefly, the benefits of learning outside. So I'll give you some project ideas and then I'll talk to you about pedagogy, where would you start and how would you learn more. I would like to thank the university's funding partners, Google, CSIRO and OzCyber. And I would also like to thank the Nature School for allowing me to use images of their learning and some students. So STEAM or STEM, it's actually an education that is an integrated and applied approach to learning. And I like to consider it a pedagogy. It's actually a way of learning and it's actually a way of teaching science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. And it can be used to investigate real world problems and an integrated approach to learning these things in an applied way. My belief is that when you're teaching STEM projects, if you're including two areas to, for a deep dive into those subject areas, then you're teaching STEM. You don't actually have to be teaching all the areas at once. This conference is about sustainable development goals, so I don't need to talk to you too much about what those are. We, we will just move on to the next component. Firstly, I'd like to address what the benefits of outdoor learning, other than the current pandemic and the benefits of being outside and socially distant, there are actually a whole heap of other parts to learning outside which are beneficial to children and to adults. We've got enhanced personal and social communication skills. We've got physical health, academic achievement. It engages a different group of children by providing opportunities to learn in a different way. That is not a textbook and is not worksheets. So this provides opportunities for children to learn in new ways, in a way that capitalizes on things that they're already interested in and broadens their curiosity. We're able to develop active citizens through citizen science and also by educating them about the environment that they live in. We can move on into developing resilience and the ability to learn in a new and uncertain environment, provide challenges that, and taking risk is a big thing. It's a safe risk. How do we teach children to take safe risks? And for some, it also enhances their spiritual and sensory awareness. So the first project that I'm going to talk about is related to outcome uh, sustainable development goals 6, 14 and 15. It's about clean water, life under the water and life on the land. 
And this was actually a task that I did with my class at the beginning of this year, where we were investigating river systems and we were investigating the importance of vegetation on the cleanliness of river water and river health. This was particularly important for my area because we were part of the bushfires that we had 12 months ago. And so a lot of the bushfire went through our local bushland, which then impacted on the water health. And the river that we are looking investigating was part of our water supply. So what we did was we designed some filtration systems that could filter dirty water. And these, these had different effects uh, depending on how the students structured the filtration system. Now, the water at the bottom there, uh, underneath those drink bottles in that level there, that is actually quite dirty. But compared with the water that went in, the students decided that the more mulch and the more uh, cotton that they had in the bottle, the cleaner the water came at the bottom uh, once it went through the filtration. During our COVID lockdown, which was in April, the students, one of the challenges they were given was to redesign that filtration system so that they could improve the process. So the STEM concepts that we covered were design, engineering and scientific investigation. And the science of that was about quality of water and methods of filtration. So this was done with a group of children who are aged between year three and year four, which is about nine years old. Another project that I've used this year was counters, using microbits as data collectors. And this addressed life below water and life on land. So we used it for counting things that we can see in the water or counting, in this instance, birds. So the STEM concepts that we've covered were digital technologies, digital systems, coding, scientific inquiry and collecting data. And this had an application of using a counter to collect data that then later we can have an activity where we can then use it for graphing and presenting that data. In term one, when we did our river unit, one of our novels or graphic novel was called River Time by Trace Barler. And in that book, it talked about Aboriginal culture and some of the handy, the ways that they created rope. And that was with a method called cordage. And you can see in the bottom two pictures there, we've got a picture of a child making cordage. And we also have a picture of the rope sitting on the table. And that technique was then used by the students to create lengths of rope. And we also used another method with raffia to create a crown. And that was done by simply a circle method and then tying it together and slipping the leaves in. I've actually included a how-to video down the bottom there so that you'll be able to go through and watch that if you would like. I think the benefit of this is it highlights uh, our Aboriginal culture in Australia and how they actually made things like fishing nets and bags, traps, and they used this technique to actually create things at a time when it's um, when there was no, you know, no shops and places to go and buy things. And that's a really important thing for the children to understand that there was actually no uh, commercial markets that they are used to and that's sometimes hard for them to understand. So by doing this we're looking at responsible consumption and production and how can we be sustainably uh, friendly with the way we make things. This project is a pressure switch and I've got a video at the bottom there which will take you to a YouTube on how to make this. It's made with a couple of pieces of cardboard 
and some foil and some popping paper. You could use foam or sponge in between. And I got this project idea from the Makey Makey Instructables website, which I have a link to at the end. Now, by doing this, we used it as a counter again and we used it to count things in our playground. And we actually, at our school, our Wi-Fi actually now extends beyond the building and beyond the classroom so we can be outside our classrooms in our learning space with our computers connected to Wi-Fi. And it was hooked up to Scratch. So this was a really great way to integrate your technology and your design into a project. Mm -hmm. And we, you can use this for multiple things. So we've used it for an on and off switch for a cardboard machine. We used it for counting and surveying things in our yard, in our playground. You could use, One of the students designed a prototype for a pressure pad to be used at the opening of our national park. It wasn't, of course, durable enough to be used for that, but the prototyping process is a really great way to, for students to explore how things may or may not work. Another suggestion was to actually use very thin cardboard and place it out, see if birds would actually jump on the presser switch if you put seed or some sort of nectar in the centre. And another one we actually made was a prototype with an alarm system that students thought we could put near an endangered creature's habitat to protect it from hunters or illegal poaching. Uh, we also used it for data collection in the classroom where we surveyed in maths um, favourite ice creams or favourite cakes and then they had to graph the results. So you can see it's quite a versatile project that can be used for a range of things and really you're just limited by your imagination. And this is the really simple code. So year three, they're eight and coding isn't something they've done a lot of when, I, when they come into year three. So this is a really simple block of code that was done in Scratch that can be made more complicated for those who need it later. The next project is about temperature with microbits. And once again, this can this is a really simple project. And I've actually made this for use with a very young grade, uh, simply so they could see if it was cold or hot or cold or warm. That 25 is degrees Celsius. So that's like nice shorts and t-shirt weather. Uh, so the students just took it and put it into different environments. So the microboard temperature is based on the temperature of the board, not the air temperature. So if we put it in front of the air conditioner, it went really cold. If we put it outside on the ground, it went really hot. One day it went up to 56 degrees, which I, am, I believe that 40 degrees Celsius is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can be used for different um, for different projects where students go out and explore hot and cold. So for really young students, that's a great project. Uh, you could use it to explore different environments outside under the shade of a tree, or you could look in the sun or under rocks or, you know, down near the water. Does it change downhill, uphill? And you can modify that 25 to be, you know, a little lower or higher depending on your climate. Our local weather bureau also has historical data. So if you're doing this with older children, rather than have a picture, you might have words pop up. The next project is a far more complicated project, which is recording maximum and minimum values. And you can see you've got if else statements, which is your branching, uh, which is that green, the green block. And you can see it's if it's less than 21 degrees or if it's more than 27. So 27 degrees is starting to get warm, quite warm. You've got a whole range of different digital, uh, different STEM concepts that are covered there. And it can be used to explore climate and temperature change and life on Earth. So potentially you could use this to collect data on a daily basis. You could use it to compare with traditional thermometers. 
Uh, and you would, once again, a lot of it's outside. So you're looking at different environments around the playground, or if you are off site, you could go and explore different areas and different temperatures. I've included down the bottom a link to this project itself because I was quite conscious that you can't actually read really very well in that picture. So the maximum thermometer link at the bottom will take you to the microbit website where it has the actual project. And Python data logger would be more of a secondary uh, project where it's using text-based coding to actually log data. So it records the value. You leave the microbit plugged into your computer and it will actually record the values for you so you can export it to a spreadsheet and then manipulate it in maths. Uh, this is a really cute little project that I've had two different groups of students apply in the real world. One student's made it and used it as an intruder alert. <clears throat> so in our classroom we have two lizards and they live in a tank and we have it, one of them tries to escape if the door is left open. So he's made this intruder alert to hang on the door and if somebody opens the door, if the lizard pushes the door open, if it's left unlocked, it will make a sound. That underline there is a link to YouTube of that, how that works. And then the second is a prototype for dynamite fishing. So there was a competition this year and two students created this as a prototype uh, for detecting if people are using dynamite to fish on the Great Barrier Reef. So this technically wasn't an outdoor project, but it is about a real world project. So in both instances though, you could be actually doing the coding on a table outside in the playground or just move your classroom outside and sit outside the door. So this is the prototype for the dynamite fishing and I've got a link there to the video of the project. So the students decided they need some refinements to this project. So they need a sensor on the microbeer to detect weather. So if the water is rocking, uh, the microbit uh, won't send false data. So what the project actually was, a micro, they believed that a microbit would be attached in a waterproof box to a buoy and the, one of the flotation devices out on the barrier reef. And if there's dynamite fishing, their, their assumption was that the waves would rock, therefore the microbit would shake. And you can see the code is on shake send a message and the message will call the alert. So the alert is show an icon and start to play the music. And when the message radio is the radio message is received, then the music would play. So they decided they need a sensor for weather tracking so that if the if it's bad weather then the boy would rock as well so that the ranger would know if it's bad weather or if it's actually dynamite fishing. They felt that there should be live data tracking of movement and perhaps a camera and they also felt that um, by placing a camera on the boy you'd be able to see if there was anyone physically visible, physically low, close. So the next project is about moisture and once again the microbits can be used to detect moisture in the ground. You can use a moisture probe or you could um, use two nails and some wire. So um, uh, for, for those who haven't seen microbits, if you just google BBC microbit or go to the microbit.org website it will give you a whole lot of information about what they are. They're really low cost and they're quite versatile little um, devices. So um, this project will actually allow us to track climate action um, and also life on land. The reason climate change or climate action is because it's detecting uh, how moist soil is. So in a hot climate, you're going to lose your moisture from your soil quite quickly. So um, 12 months ago, there was zero moisture in our soil. That's why the country was on fire. Um, but now we've got uh, the La Nina effect happening and we've now got a lot of rain happening. So hopefully we'll be safe for a little bit now. Um, but this covers STEM concepts such as digital technologies, your coding, scientific inquiry, and also your mathematics. So you could be collecting moisture, collecting data, 
you could be looking at temperature. If you could get a temperature probe, you could be also detecting temperature of the soil as well and collecting that information. And by doing that, it allows you to investigate what plants grow in what soil, how much moisture is required in the soil in order for a plant to grow. Different plants need different moisture content. And it'll, what it allows for is rather than your traditional science investigation where let's see if the plant will grow with no water, let's see if the plant will grow in the cupboard with no light, you can actually start to do a proper scientific inquiry into how much water is needed for that plant to grow. You could tie in your maths by working out how much volume of water is given to each plant so that you can track different amounts of moisture in different plants and in different gardens. The pedometer project is about good health and well-being. So this is about children working out how active they need to be and you could tie this in with um, a personal development or a health project but once again this is an outside project because if you are inside you won't be doing very many steps and this might be something where the students design something to hold the micro bit onto their shoe or onto their arm they could compare what how many steps they do in different places so if it's on my arm, does it track my, how many steps do I walk? If I walk the same distance and it's strapped to my wrist, how many steps do I walk? And if it's strapped to my shoe, what sort of steps do I walk? And you might actually have someone count the steps so that you can compare distance and, and number of steps. Um, this is a really great project because it's a good way to see who is running around the most at lunch and as you can imagine kids get quite competitive and want to actually trigger the steps and it works with on shake once again for so the people who haven't done much coding at the start of the project it will set the steps to zero and then forever it's going to show the number of steps on the screen and it will pause 100 milliseconds each time a step is triggered and then on shake it will change the steps by one so you can make this a more complicated program for people who are um, able where you could have a, a triggered by if i press a button it will make it reset to zero um, but this is a really simple beginners coding project this is all linked to good health and well-being by encouraging children to have active lifestyles so you've got your digital technologies, you've got digital systems, coding, and then you've got a design element where the students are required to design a band to hold the micro bit and attach it to their, to their shoe. You've got maths with length and distance. How far is one step? How far is 100 steps? And so they actually have to then measure. You might have trundle wheels or long tapes to actually be able to measure how far they're walking and compare the number of steps. Depending on their age, compare number of steps for each other and compare number of steps to a more commercial um, pedometer such as a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or another Garmin and they could actually compare to those and see if they work. I know that my son's Fitbit, if he just shakes his hand, it will do steps, whereas with my Apple Watch, that doesn't work. It's linked in with your heart rate and all sorts of other things as well. It would be interesting to compare which is better. So once again, that's going to be dependent on the age of your students. Once you've got into your collecting data, there's another opportunity for your maths. Now, when you're doing this outside, all these projects and the measurement is all working outside with your trundle wheels and your tapes. And then rather than going back into the classroom, just working outside at you know, lunch tables or sitting on seats under the tree. We actually have blankets at school which we spread out. The kids can all just sit on the a blanket and work with a clipboard or a whiteboard and that actually encourages children to do their work outside. This is now the part where I talk about how this actually works. Two years ago, I was in a school, traditional school, where we sit at desks in the classroom, we use work worksheets and we use textbooks. This year I started at this school where 
Um, predominantly it's outside one full day a week and it's outside, they like us to be outside one session a day at least. And that's the philosophy of the school. And if you had have asked me 18 months ago or 12 months ago if I would be able to teach like that, I probably would have said no. What you need to think about is how can you reinvent your teaching? So we are often told that textbooks and worksheets aren't in the best interests of the child. So how can we modify and use what we have around us without expense to actually be able to teach outside, particularly in the current environment where we need to be socially distant? And the first thing I would say is you can be outside your classroom and use the seating and the tables that you have in your playground just to do your learning. Um, I have been surprised the students that are often disruptive in class are often more calm and settled outside and you find there's different students struggle with being outside to what's inside. So it's interesting to watch the changes in behaviour. You can sit under a tree in the playground and if you're in a city school where you don't have that sort of um, outdoor space you could sit on a basketball court you could sit outside on a piece of cement it doesn't have to be on the grass you can see that I'm in quite a rural setting so it's quite lovely sitting looking out over the cows but you don't have to have that you can just utilize the playground that you have that timber space where they are now that's actually an outdoor learning area that has been built because uh, I'm in Australia we have quite a lot of strong sun and so the that area has a cover on it so that the students can work outside in the fresh air but not in the sun. We also go on field trips to local parks and local habitats. For a lot of schools that's a big expense. We actually get our parents to drop the students at the space where we're where we're meeting for the day one day a week. So what do you need to consider if you are going to sit outside? And the first thing we need to consider is protection from the weather and extremes of temperature. So in Australia, it's an extreme of heat, but I'm quite conscious that in the Northern Hemisphere, that would be an extreme of cold. And uh, our rule is if you're outside in the heat, you wear a hat. If you're outside in the rain, you wear a rain jacket. And if you're in, in, if you're in the wind, you put on a jumper. So the only time the students really have indoor play during breaks is if it's lightning storms. Uh, the students are required to be outside every break regardless of the weather and they're expected to bring the appropriate clothing for that. So we need to think about weather and temperature. We need to lay our clothing. So you need to reteach the children how to wear, what to wear to school it's about layering our clothes so that we're in a space that's wearing clothing that's suitable for the environment that we're going to be working in today. So in a space where you wear casual clothing, you might give advance warning of what your activities will be that day so that the students know to wear shorts or jeans rather than a skirt. You need to consider students with a disability. So if they have, have mobility problems, then you would need to select a space that is going to allow for those students to be able to access that. And you also need to consider permission. So we have a permission note that goes home at the beginning of each year that essentially gives us permission to travel anywhere in Port Macquarie without a signature. So the beginning of the year, the parents sign a note to say, I give permission for my child to go anywhere in our local area and then we just inform the parents the weekend before this is where we'll be on Wednesday and the parents then drop their children at that space. Uh, we have permission in that note to also go for wanders which means we can leave the school grounds and we can walk around our local streets uh, without a written permission note because the parents have granted that permission at the beginning of the year. Some people might need permission from the school. So th that is my school's philosophy. But if you're a single teacher in a larger school that doesn't actually have that 
that pedagogy. You might need permission from your school to actually even be outside, which is the case for my previous school. And you, if you're going into a local habitat or park, you might need permission from your local parks authority or your local government or local district. You might also need permission to access if it's a private land. How do you eliminate risk? Uh, so in a litigious society, we actually do have to think about risk and we have to do a risk assessment for each time we go off site. And we've done risk assessments of our local, our school grounds, so we know where the risk risk is in our school grounds. And one of the biggest risks for us, of course, is actually sunburn. We have to think about what the hazards there are and how would you eliminate those or minimise that risk. So you can see here the students are at the beach, so the risk is, of course, drowning. Um, but the rule is there's no swimming. We don't swim on these days. The only time we swim at the beach is if we're going with trained lifeguards or trained uh, lifesavers. So these are just walks along the beach and we may go into rock pools if it's low tide. First aid is a big thing and so the teacher must carry a first aid kit at all times. And student medication, the student must carry their own medication and the teacher also carries a spare so that we can be sure that we have enough Ventolin and EpiPens for those that need it. So the pedagogy that we use when you're teaching outside is called Nature Pedagogy and I've put an underlined link there to go to a site about Nature Pedagogy but there is quite a few. A lot of Nature Pedagogy refers to early years, so pre-school and pre-kindy. Um, so into the primary and the high school zone, there isn't a lot of preset work. So I'm pretty much making up some of this. So in Australia, there isn't a lot. In England and Europe, they're called forest schools or bush schools. And so you can actually research forest schools to find more information. When you're outside, uh, you can still teach maths and English. So we play relays for spelling games and maths concepts. We read stories. We, everyone has a book. They do art. So there's all sorts of different activities that you can do outside. And remembering that this, this act day where we're in the bush is only one day a fortnight. And then we have one day on the other fortnight where we're outside at school, which means we can access school resources. But everything we take into these one day fortnight activities we have to basically carry in ourselves. So the students bring in their own clipboard, they bring a pen and they bring a nature journal, which is really just a visual diary. And they have to carry that themselves in a backpack. Uh, something you have to learn when you're teaching outside is behavior management. I usually carry a whistle to gain attention. It's about having a safety briefing right at the start of the day so the students know what to be aware of and what dangers there might be if we're in a new space, drawing attention to those new dangers. And I also do a visual countdown where I hold my hand up and I say five, you know, you're turning and looking at me, four, you're not talking, three, you're going to have your mouth closed and, and do a countdown. And that is a very effective way because it's visual and they can also hear your voice. We're not working with textbooks and worksheets and we're also looking at inquiry and project-based learning. So we do a lot of citizen science and citizen science is when you're collecting data to solve problems of other scientists. And I usually submit that for them on their behalf. We do a lot of shared learning. So floor books, and I've put a link there to a page about floor books. Floor books are when you, I usually use about A3 sized paper and I put a layout for them and they share what they know on that page. So rather than using lined exercise books, we actually use um, draw your own picture, draw your own, write your own sentences. I give some lined boxes and some empty boxes. Um, that's because we're learning to structure our shared work. Um, I would think ideally we would move toward a space where they would do that and lay out their own work as they want. 
And we've also been learning how to do a floor book on, in PowerPoint where I've made templates for them on an A3 size and they write it all up in PowerPoint and then we can print it out. So we still do use computers. We don't go down the pathway of gaming and when I use computers, it's for a particular purpose, such as the coding projects that you saw before. Other skills that you might need to learn with your nature pedagogy, depending on your location, you might need to rethink how we use technology. We will need more batteries. We'll need better Wi-Fi in the school grounds. Um, you might need to know mapping and compass skills. And so um, the students are all taught how to light and set a fire and get some survival skills if they're ever out in the bush and get lost. And they're also taught fire safety. They're taught how to climb a tree safely. Uh, so there's a lot of things that they're taught just simply because they're outside. Uh, water safety is another thing, making sure you know how deep the water is before you cross a creek, those sorts of things. Some of the things that students might need to know and this is knowledge that you build over time, is they will need to be taught what are the sustainable development goals. And I've done that by putting them up in my classroom and every time we do a project, I pull out the, the goals that are actually linked. Uh, we, we might explore new ways of learning and using our floor books, of course, the students need to be taught how to structure floor books. They need to be taught how to do, use their nature journal and that link there takes you to a wonderful Australian site about nature journaling. They also need to be taught how to use a compute camera and how to create mud maps of areas that we're learning about. So a mud map is like a, a rough sketch of an area um, with, you know, they might put particular trees or um, landmarks and they've even given names on the places we go to regularly they've given them names so there's a tree that was struck by lightning so they always draw the lightning tree on the map so we know where that is in the scheme of where we're walking. So what I'd like to do is have a bit of a sharing opportunity so you can see I've got a Padlet there. You may have clicked on this and be able to see this through the Beluga or you may just like to type it in yourself. How I am using SDGs, you'll need to type all of that link and it's case sensitive. So you'll have to type it exactly as I've got it. And then what I've got is different columns that will allow you to share different types of project ideas, different links, and I've put all of mine in there. And it will also give you an opportunity to share your contact details. So we, where are you on social media? I've put on mine in there and you'll be able to share yours so we can hopefully connect and continue this conversation later. So here's some links to some resources. Now, as I said before, I work for the University of Adelaide and we have online courses for teaching digital technologies, which is why a lot of my projects had coding and technology in them. Uh, so these are some of the links that you might like to use and to learn more about digital technologies. This second one, free online courses, we have got a whole stack of free online courses that um, you can access to learn about digital technologies, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and they're all a really easy, there's, there's no presumed knowledge. This is the link down the bottom here, csermooks.adelaide.edu.au, and these are our courses. So if you're a elementary to middle school teacher, you would start with the foundations to six and move on to the extended course. If you're a secondary teacher, um, then you would, if you have no skills and you don't know anything about computing or tech coding, you would start with the foundations course as well. And then you might move on to the next steps or the explore. Next steps is app development and explore is game development. And then you also have your teaching AI in the classroom. There is a primary and a high school version of that course. And cybersecurity and awareness has a primary and a high school version of those as well. Uh, really great courses, all free. You need a Gmail to sign in because it's sponsored by Google. If you'd like to find out more about the University of Adelaide, you can contact them through any of these places. 
and I will be putting a link to this presentation in the Beluga chat. And then finally, if you would like to connect with me, you can connect with me as iMarionet. And I'm pretty much iMarionet on most of platforms. So if you do a search on that, you'll find me. And I would like to thank you for joining me today. I'd like to thank the ISTE group for the opportunity to speak. I've been very excited about speaking here today and I'm hoping that I can connect with you and continue this chat later. Thank you.